forward as its big vision wants to, and, is, and, and, and we'll get there, we're sure, connect healthcare for everyone. That's what we're out to do. And our, our mission that we're on currently is to build the largest network of healthcare professionals in the world. Hello everybody, we are live, it is 2019 and we are joined by Dr. Barney Gilbert. Barney, thank you for joining us. Thanks very much for having me, great to be with you guys. Uh, Barney, is you're one of those rare individuals who's managed to get a medical, medical degree, be a doctor and start a company, which is uh, no mean feat, um, and you are the founder of Forward Health. Um, so how did you bridge the gap between sort of going on this trajectory where a lot of people are you know, from 15, 16 and deciding to be doctors to mm. then transitioning into becoming an entrepreneur? Mm. I think probably in a snapshot, not consciously. I think um, I was somebody who as a teenager was really keen to be a doctor. And I think as soon as you become a doctor, it's clear that there are lots of problems around that need fixing and everybody can see that. And then it sort of becomes a, a question of, do you have the desire and the stamina and the willpower to try and solve them? Um, and yeah, that was to a degree how, how Forward got got started. I'm definitely not a lone warrior in this. There's uh, two two co-founders, Philip and Lydia, who, who have been with me uh, since the start and, and, and um, have been fantastic support in this journey. So uh, yeah, we've, we've got up and running. But your trajectory was, so you, you met us in at Oxford and then you, had, you went to Harvard for a bit. Yeah, that's right. To do, but it wasn't to do medicine. You see, I'm, I'm somebody who's always been fascinated in I think two things. One is how people think, and the other is how systems and society, not just in healthcare, but, but beyond that, are knitted together. And so for me, even in healthcare, it was always about thinking about problems from a system or kind of macro lens. Um, and so partway through medical school, just, just at the end of medical school, I went to Harvard to study economics. Um, and for me, that was fantastic because it just gave this completely new dimension to mm. thinking about things and then coming back to the UK eventually to work as a, a, a doctor was a completely different experience to what it would have been because I had this clarity on how um, I thought that the system was operating uh, and the things I was observing around me. So do you think without that experience in, in the US you maybe wouldn't have come to the same, you know, you'd just be being a, a doctor now rather than yeah, I think, to, I think solve problem. highly likely. One of the great things that, that I did whilst living in the US was work with a, a brilliant kind of product-led healthcare company uh, called Wellframe, which taught me a lot about how a successful product-driven company actually emerges from nothing into something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was a team of about 15 people when I was uh, working there. And just, just learning a, a huge amount um, a huge amount there that I'm happy to delve, delve into, but that really gave the, the confidence to come back and think, hang on, maybe there is a problem I can take on, um, y you know, myself and, and, and with a team. Mm. I guess when you're on a trajectory to be a, a doctor, having a sort of hiatus within that mm. um, is quite an attractive thing because I presumably you didn't know that you were going to then move into entrepreneurialism. Mm. Um, but what about um, Lydia and Philip, your, your co-founders? Mm. Mm. So they, they've got an amazing story. So when I met them together, they were dating and they're now married. Okay. Um, so they're they're a you know romantic and married couple. Um, How's that third wheeling in your company? Yeah, I know, essentially, <laughs> this is our. I think our internal uh, get to know the team describes me as a professional third wheel. Um, so Lydia was a friend from Oxford at medical school, and she met Philip doing a yoga class in London. And Philip was someone who'd been building companies for ten years or so before this one, mm. um, and his background is in. Uh, originally software engineering and, and virtual reality kind of before that became a, a mega thing and he was determined really through chatting with Lydia who was who was dating as I say and then me you know, around that time that healthcare was an industry worth getting involved in um, and if the opportunity that you're looking for is to use product to solve problems that are actually meaningful for people mm. there's probably no better space to be because well, we, we have had a long history with healthcare in terms of the fundraising um, space. Mm. And, and what I used to be faced with back in 2010 was a lot of speculative drug 
mm. trials, discoveries, approval processes, which were these enormously long protracted processes um, requiring huge amounts of cash before they either, you know, ever turned a penny of revenue. Um, and it's seen that data mm. and technology offers a, a completely different spin on addressing mm. healthcare issues without having to go through the same amount of regulatory approvals. Mm. And so therefore you can get people like Philip mm. who can take their previous entrepreneurial experience and mm. start to apply it in a sort of software engineering um, problem mm. solving capacity. Um, were the, So with them dating, was mm. there any reticence for you to then join on as this third wheel and think actually, is this gonna be a problem you know, starting a company with founders who are sort of... Well, know, where, where did the germ of the idea come from? Mm. So L Lydia was speaking to Philip a lot about communication being broken in healthcare. It's really obvious to probably everyone that's ever worked as a doctor in, in the NHS and in most Western health systems that carrying a, a pager in your pocket or using workarounds like Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or Snapchat or WeChat are not adequate for communicating critical information about your patients um, and the three of us in about September of 2016 basically fleshed this out over a series of conversations and started wireframing an app um, that we thought would be our best fit solution and it's always you know when you look back on things it's always an MVP that was horrible at the time but it was our best fit solution to solve this really meaningful problem for people working in, in the UK health service in the NHS um, the way we try and think about the question you've asked now is because everyone's so aware of this problem, whether they're working as a junior doctor, a really senior doctor, a nurse, a dietitian in the community, a physio, whoever they might be in this massive system, everybody has communication challenges. They're all slightly nuanced and slightly different, but they want them solved. And so they, in a sense, are the founder of their own solution. And that's how we try and perceive it, because that really empowers this network and community of people to solve their communication problems. I think there's a lot of myths that go around about what the existing um, processes are in the NHS. I mean, if you can paint us a picture as a, as a junior doctor trying to sort of fill in paperwork and stuff, how bad is it in mm. terms of data transfer? Is it very manual? Because you were, you were practicing as a junior yeah, doctor. Yeah, that's right. So when this, was, when this was kicking off, and for the, for the two years around that, I was still working in the system. And, and the answer is it's really painful. Um, this is why, you know, if you look at Lydia and my uh, year group of friends from medical school, most or, or approaching most, somewhere probably around 50% have left current practice in the NHS. And these are people that have been trained uh, heavily subsidized by the government to go and become doctors that have had dreams of being doctors. Since they're very young. Who are, Since they're very young yeah. and who are still fairly young and who are, uh, positive people who get the positivity stamped out of them by the system and that that is you know hours per day of bureaucratic work there's a guy called Atul Gawande who's a, a actually a professor at Harvard but a surgeon in the US as well who writes brilliantly for the New Yorker on this stuff and he wrote a great article about why doctors hate computers in healthcare recently and uh, I definitely recommend anybody reading it but it basically says whatever system you're working in, this is just painful and it shouldn't be. There are, there are pains that healthcare workers go through with IT and with um, technology that are just not accepted in other industries. Mm -hmm. well, is that because the, the healthcare industry is, is it fair to say that it's notoriously slow at um, bringing in new technologies or even just change? Mm. Yeah, and there's two sides of that coin. That's definitely the truth. The, the positive side of that coin is the system is set up like that because patients are being cared for and these are often life or death decisions that are being made on any technology or with any piece of regulation. And so it's important that there is rigor in all of that. On the flip side, when you're trying to innovate and you know, dare we say even disrupt, <laughs> it comes with a pain barrier. There is a lot of... Um, there are many painful hurdles to overcome and the processes, whether it's for governance, procurement, um, establishing organic networks, all of these things are painful. Well, and I guess the, when the NHS is such a considerable employer, any technology you roll out, I assume, you have to be comfortable that most of the employees within the NHS can skillfully use that. So mm. um, you're always going to be hamstrung versus, I guess, private enterprise. Because like, what, what's, what's the difference in the way that private clinics can work with patient data and mm. those relationships is that considerably mm. more efficient and so the, the truth is 
often not. There are there are some cases where things are more streamlined in the private sector, and generally that, that's because the, the networks for procurement or for implementation are smaller. It's not because the laws are different. Hmm. Um, generally speaking, the private sector in the UK, um, health sector, is, is going to be regulated under GDPR, just like the, the NHS will be. And, and, and when you got a little look at how America's private healthcare system worked, potentially when you were over mm. there, um, did you notice any stark differences in the, the way that just because again, it, it's sort of a bit of a black box. Mm. We just make assumptions about how mm. the American healthcare system works. But mm. what was your view on that? Well, just like the NHS, it's something that within a year or so, you can get to understand quite deeply. Just like the NHS, there are nuances of the system that you that you need to understand if you're going to navigate successfully. And the, the types of stakeholder, particularly with insurers that you might need to engage as, a, as an early company are different. The the major difference and the thing that's so positive and that gave me confidence whilst in the US is that you get support from your senior clinicians, from investors, from university and academic backers much earlier in the US than you might in the UK. So if you have a brilliant idea at a hackathon at MIT on a Saturday morning, by Sunday night, if you're expert and you've pulled together a good team, you could have funding for it. Wow. And that's completely different to guys in the NHS. And the game is changing here. Um, you know, there's a program called the the Entrepreneurs Program, the Clinical Entrepreneurs Program, run by a, a kind of coach and a mentor of mine called Tony Young, which is fantastic and has got more than a hundred entrepreneurs in in healthcare together to be part of a network like that. But the the uh, the bar hasn't got quite so high yet. When also there's is there, there's no um, special avenue for funding. Like NHS doesn't have a a budget for investing or giving grants to to um, health projects. Yeah, that's 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 right. There are there are some grants that are out there, but often chasing down a grant is really tough. Requires serious kind of quantitative mm -hmm. backing, and the grant might only be for ten to fifty thousand pounds. So it's hard to get a lot done with that. I, my experience of, of the healthcare industry is friends who went through medicine at Imperial, I did biology, mm, mm. Um, and you'd think in the melting pot of Imperial there's a perfect environment for um, computer science students to be liaising and mm. meeting with doctors, but the doctors were cleaved off a lot doing their own mm. thing and with their own union and stuff like that. Should have gone to yoga classes together. Okay, yeah, right, well, if that's how you have to meet co-founders these days, <laughs> then so be it. Um, and, and that was probably a bit of a failure of the system. I think somebody wasn't... And, I don't think the discussions were being pushed towards doctors about getting a, a meaningful understanding of technology mm. available to them. And, and similarly, I don't think enough was being done on the other side to sort of match up to the, to the doctors and the healthcare departments. Um, so if that can be you know, not successfully addressed in Imperial, where you've mm. got a small, tiny campus, uh, you can see why it's not, not working at a larger scale. Mm. For sure. Um, can we take a step back for a moment? I'd yeah. like to sort of get a better handle on how you went from that idea between the three of you mm. to executing it to mm. where it is now mm. and in fact it'd probably be helpful just to give us your sort of nutshell su summary mm. of what forward health mm. is about mm. okay so forward as its big vision wants to and is and, and and we'll get there we're sure connect healthcare for everyone that's what we're out to do and our our mission that we're on currently is to build the largest network of healthcare professionals in the world we're currently only in the UK and for deliberate reason that, that we can explore if, if you guys want to. It's an app at its core and it is becoming a platform um, which is really important in healthcare in terms of how data moves around within different parts of a system. But at its core it's an app. We've made something available to healthcare professionals all across the UK from their own app store to download something that's core functioning is instant messaging. That's got to be secure and there's work that you've got to do to make that secure over a tool like say WhatsApp. But to make it fit for purpose in the healthcare space? Well to make it secure for purpose and then in terms of fit for purpose there's a feature set around that which can be quite simple from the start mm -hmm. which adds value way beyond what any other instant messaging tools might be able to do. Those can be simple things like connecting uh, a bit like on Slack you have channels of, of, of your team. Um, you can do similar things but you can also start to connect um, across departments in a hospital say or across healthcare regions and wider networks and you can start to channel referrals and advice about patients right across the system. Who so. defines those those specific channels that you create and use? Um, 
so if, if it's a but it's, oh, well, well more to the point it sounds like individuals can download the app but how mm. do you establish sort of a, a meaningful base of operations mm. within each organization to you mm. know is it the chelsea and westminster mm. x-ray department mm. who have their own channel mm. or do you sell it to chelsea and westminster who then subdivide it sure so the big macro point here is it for us it's all organic it is not mandated technology and that is a shift change in how healthcare implements te technology of any kind mm -hmm. but obviously for organic uh, tech to be successful it has to be popular it has to be shared and the way to make it popular and we haven't cracked all of this at all or we would we would have 10 million users in more than just uh, far more than just the European system the way to make it uh, popular is to add value immediately so people that for example do things that are image heavy in their day-to-day -day clinical workflow so people that might want to you're right share x-rays or share wound images or share images of bed sores between particular nursing types um, or share photos of rashes between dermatology doctors these are groups of clinicians for whom secure image sharing is going to add big value there are several areas like that but that's one where you think okay if we can get a hub of that kind of user within a particular network let's expand from there and let's have this idea of a wedge rollout where each part of a wedge there's a narrow funnel at the start and a very wide funnel at the end and you're trying to connect a highly activated network by adding in groups and departments that get more and more value from the from from them being added and what was the existing way to um, share large image files before? I mean, was mm. it posting x-rays? Mm. Was it delivering them by hand? Pigeon. Pigeon. I mean, you laugh at it, that those are the sorts of techniques that wouldn't be frowned upon. Um, broadly speaking, you can walk around and go and find people in person. You can radio page someone if you want to transfer a message over a landline phone network. But people were fed up with those methods, so had largely pivoted to tools like WhatsApp, where you get an app. So we know that the health force is is ready to do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that something like WhatsApp is inadequate. It doesn't have quite quite have the features you need to communicate well in healthcare, and it's not secure. And so, is is this? I'm trying to understand uh, whether I'm sort of putting it in like a WeChat bucket or a mm. WhatsApp chat. Is it? Does it have like modular add-ons that may be more specific for different use cases? So, if I went in as a uh, uh, a general user, mm. you've got feature sets that I can mm. then add into the app. Mm. So we are working towards that at the moment. Generally speaking, you will have a, a standardized profile which has a feature set which are generally useful, though depending on what the, the type of user you are, certain things will, will add more value than others. So for example, for junior doctors seeking advice from senior doctors, there, there is inbuilt capacity to close a loop on advice that you've, you've sought out or to refer a patient to somebody. That sounds incredibly simple. It's incredibly important to get it right because if this information is lost or if loops aren't closed appropriately, patients fall through the cracks. Um, and to go back to, to Ollie's point, um, you, you, you wireframe this, you came together, you've created the ideas, MVP. Mm. How do you, did you then bring it to life? Who did mm. you pitch mm -hmm. to? Who did you lobby? Mm. Um, so we raised some very uh, early investment and had a loan up front. We did the initial engineering work offshore uh, in a with a central European team who have been um, fantastic and then commence the process of constant learning and refinement and going around like any product driven company thinking about how can we have a really u lean approach to our user experience and how can we make sure that the questions we're asking of our users are the right ones to, to, to figure out if we're creating value. Um, and then in terms of uh, actually selling it into places. Mm. You mentioned that you're trying to grow it organically as mm. opposed to the traditional NHS mm. model of top down. Mm. So you're going around to particular institutions and presenting it to basically to the consumer rather than to the uh, the powers that be. Is mm. that right? Yeah. So there is a there is a big differential in our model between users and potential buyers. We've said to all healthcare professionals, this is and always will be free for you to use. If we want to generate revenue from it, and we have experimented with different ways of doing this, and we have not settled on one particular model for, okay. our, for our life cycle, it's, it's essential that we guarantee NHS Trust that we will not expand our costing outside of their budget. So we lock in a particular price point and, and we'll, we'll respect that. Uh, and we have trust, incidentally, as a, as a core value uh, in the company, and we don't want to kind of mess people around on that. 
would it be seen as you're holding people to ransom at that point if you've got lots of valuable data that's being exchanged and processes that now rely on mm. your technology mm. that you yeah if you if you say well it's going to cost you 30 pounds per user per month mm. Uh, the pain point for them to to not keep up with the technology will be mm. considerable, and mm. also that's quite irresponsible. And the whole aim is to save lives and keep mm. um, business working efficiently. But doesn't it also cause a blockage when you know, say, doctor in X hospital wants to start using your your app but can't because they're not licensing it? Yeah. So this this is a complicated and emerging area of healthcare mm. because post GDPR in May 2018. Essentially, every healthcare organisation needs to needs to control the patient data that is moving through it, and so we need to make sure that we sign um, agreements with trust to make sure that the way that we are moving patient data around is compliant with the way that we want um, to do it ourselves, and that they need legally to do it themselves. So that is essential, but that's actually separate from a sales force. Mm. And we have sold forward as a very classical SaaS product on numerous occasions. And what we're trying to figure out as a uh, an ongoing commercial model is, do we want this to be per month per user classical SaaS licensing? That's a very foreign model in healthcare, mm. very established in the, in the corporate world. Do we want it to be uh, essentially freemium institutional pricing where you have a set or capped fee, and then for any premium services above that, we add on through various ways of, of doing the, the pricing for that or do we look to roll this out for research and development purposes purely potentially free of charge and then think about how the data may be displayed to organizations in ways that is powerful to them and selling them dashboard functions and, uh, and other bespoke analytics do we integrate with their current systems in a way that we charge for or do we just uh, process data and learn how to structure it efficiently and not even look to, to monetize it. Interesting, because it's funny that some consultants can come on site to organizations like NHS Trust and charge them a fortune to go in, collect some data, and then make changes or suggest changes where you'd already be privy to all that information from the inside. So I imagine even to, to external consultants looking to change make, mm. um, if they can charge you know, 1,500 qu quid mm. a day per consultant, mm. um, that that information on the movements around the hospital will be mm. invaluable to them. Mm. But then maybe you could go a step further of actually when you're sitting on that information, you can start to sort of AI triage and mm. start to look at that model, which I guess is something well. What's Novastone's model? Novast well, Novastone, so uh, a company we mm. were um, raised a lot of money for, uh, was crudely speaking WhatsApp for, for banking relationships. Mm. Um, for And presumably you've been called crudely uh, WhatsApp for healthcare mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's, it's a good way to imprint the model in people's head um, but they are able to charge a huge implementation fee to banks because banks are, are, are sitting on the corporate side of mm. um, the SaaS models mm. uh, and then the licensing fees are considerable because the efficiencies can be directly turned into revenue upside for mm. the for the bank mm. um, if they can speak to clients and, and transact faster mm. Uh, more deals go through and therefore that can be uh, attributed to more revenue for the mm. company. Whereas mm. I imagine cost reduction for the NHS, they'll just keep on trying to get you to, to reduce as many costs as humanly possible. Mm. Uh, there's, a, there's a comparison with the way governments work and the way political cycles work, um, which is obviously a big driver of how the NHS functions and how its processes have is institutionalized. And that comparison is it's very tempting for us to look to provide an in-year cash saving for an NHS trust because then they can say this has been knocked off of our balance sheet this year we will buy you for a, for a price beneath that mm. and make this a very very obvious business case that's generally how NHS business works if you have a dream and a vision beyond that and you for example say we don't just want to save healthcare professionals time this is not purely an efficiency tool it is ultimately about patient outcomes. Even if patients are passively discussed on our on our platform now and are not active participants in that system, although that is our aspiration, um, we want to improve outcomes for patients and we want to find a way ultimately to be able to make that a sustainable business. That's a long-term way of playing a business model in healthcare, just like a politician doesn't want to play a very long game and why certain funding models in, in politics like uh, social impact financing, for example, might be a more strategic way of, of actually ending financing a, a political program because you don't have to get the returns on it before you're voted for that year. Yeah, sure. that's a very good point. Um, and, and in terms of the effect you're having, 
Uh, have you got any data that's coming out from provisional studies of how much efficiency you're 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 achieving, or how you're just improving anecdotally the lives mm. of junior doctors or mm. other members of uh, mm. medical staff? So we we are doing some really exciting research with a big NHS collaboration. Part of that is quantitative, and part of it is qualitative. At the stage we're at, a lot of the qualitative stuff and the use case generation and the user storytelling is the most powerful stuff that we hear. It's, it's really inspiring and, and powerful. The quantitative stuff exists and is also um, noteworthy. So for example, an, an early study that we did showed that when used versus existing communication methods in a hospital for a series of junior doctors, forward saves about 45 minutes per shift. So if you're doing an eight hour shift, that is a very significant percentage time saving. And obviously for the trust, this is where the modeling becomes interesting. You do not simply fire your workforce for the last X percent of their working day. They continue to work. Mm. They simply channel that time back into better care for patients. And then you have to think about what's the indirect outcome then financially that we are working on. Well, it might be patient satisfaction or it might be particular patient outcomes that do improve because these highly skilled, highly trained doctors are now spending 45 minutes a day more with them. So these models are hard to prove out, mm. um, but the, the work we're doing quantitatively is starting to get there. It's almost rehumanizing the patient care by mm. freeing up doctors' time. Um, you allow them to actually have more contact with patients and, and probably in a better bedside manner as mm. well. I mean, in your experience, I don't know how long you were practicing as mm. a junior doctor, mm. um, but of an eight hour shift, mm. how much of it was um, actively helping a patient and how much of it was mm. paperwork mm. when you're when you're a, a, a true junior doctor like in the first year of your your work which is called the foundation program or the internship in the US you might spend 50 or more percent of your time doing bureaucratic tasks pr probably closer to 80 percent often actually you might have 10 percent or 20 percent with with patients at, at the bedside wow. um, and, and you, you can imagine why even in the course of a year uh, morale among doctors tails off because um, you don't you don't train to be a, a secretary. Yeah, yeah. Can can I ask about that? Just uh, no entrepreneur hat on. Just, mm. just as a doctor, how bad is it that you're always expected to fill in paperwork correctly, make decisions correctly when you are exhausted, potentially overworked, and and seemingly not paid commensurate to the amount of risk your job mm. um, puts you under? Mm. Um, what, what, how how stressful is the environment? Generally speaking, it's quite stressful. I think I was fortunate in getting through some of those experiences with less stress than other people. But the particularly terrifying and stressful experiences tend to be the night shifts because those are when you are most exposed and least supported. And so you're expected to do things that you're not trained for. Mm. And that's when stress levels, particularly when it's fast moving, can become unbearable. Um, you know, I can remember... Uh, I've written somewhere about a, a night shift carrying what felt like a belt of grenades because these pages were lined up on around you know around my waist and they're going off every minute or 30 seconds and every doctor has this kind of Pavlovian dog response of fear when the thing goes off and you know that that's going to be someone that needs you to help you know you don't really have time for it and you don't know even if you did whether you'd be equipped to, to solve their problem God. yeah because I, I was going to then get on to the point of trying to compare the stress of that to the stress of creating a company because I think entrepreneurs load themselves with stress and it's self-imposed stress mm. um, which is great because it's fueled by ambition and mm. obviously if a company seemed to be in critically bad health you do attend to it like you mm. would or may do a patient but mm. it's not life and death mm. so I'm trying to get a bit of a barometer of experience mm. to see mm. if it's similar or if actually being a doctor is really the particularly busy phase for me was trying to do both at the same time, which is why, <laughs> why, why I made the decision to, to, to step out of medicine. Um, they're very different. And one of the things that I've found since being kind of full time as, a, as an entrepreneur is that you do actually have control of what you're doing. And that's one of the amazing things about being a, a founder. Um, yes, there's a, a lot of responsibility and, and, and expectation put on you but you do have control and you can make decisions with executive authority. Whereas as a junior doctor, you, you do feel like a pawn in a big system. And for me, that's actually more stressful. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the big reasons for, for demotivation in any, in any role is if you don't feel like you're in control. Mm. Um, so I think that's 
I can't remember where I read it, but it's some advice for employees. If you, if for employers, if you want your employees to feel motivated, try and make them feel like they have at least some some form of control. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because it feels very passive yeah, as a doctor. It feels like you could... Well, if you've got 29 pages going off... And you're, but, yeah, on a daily basis, you don't have a chance to have the, the freedom of space to even think of the solutions. But I feel like even if you did propose a solution, mm. it would live and die at the, the, the coffee counter mm. with a colleague and mm. yeah. it would be no means of implementing it. Mm. It, it seems to me that one of the things that your system is going to encourage is um, the ease with which doctors within the same hospital but also within other hospitals can collaborate mm. um, quickly and efficiently mm. and so for instance on that night shift when you had all these bombs going off to stick with your analogy <laughs> um, would that help in that you could come and get someone to to, to sort that one out? Yeah, that's exactly what it's for so so we think so part of this is about um, well I, I read something recently that talked about four C words that could be fundamental to working brilliantly with people in the 21st century and the C words are communication which is obviously right at the core of what we're doing another one is collaboration another one is creativity and another one is critical thinking um, and the, the point about collaboration is collaboration is empowered by great communication and it's really simple if you think about that use case you are an isolated person in need of help you need to be able to communicate with and then ideally work with and collaborate with someone who's got the, the skills all the time to, to help you mm. so that that's absolutely what it's for and actually depending on where our lean user experience approach ends up on this journey of, of being a product led company we may be more of a collaboration tool than a pure communication tool right because i imagine also useful to this process um because it's feeling a bit more like a hub and spoke model for the healthcare industry in the UK now because as things are getting privatised that sometimes a, a small walk in NHS centre is ill-equipped to deal with the patient they are, mm. are handling and at that point you want a very quick referral system to somebody who is able to handle mm. that that um, critical condition or whatever it might be um, so I see something this as being hugely useful that you could potentially get a doctor on the referral network for our instant message mm. and say look I've got a patient who is suffering something that's way beyond us mm. how's it looking over at your department do we mm. send them to kent or do we send them to margate mm. to get this treated mm. and you can very quickly get the response which again is saving 20 minutes of decision making time which could be life or death for some people mm. um isn't that what the internet's for it's for well it's for lots of things but for <laughs> the easy exchange of really valuable information mm. yeah and i could just i could just see if, if it's and if you're still running around in hospitals with um faxes and mm. things then mm. how is anyone going to learn from mistakes mm. actually have you read a book called um, black box thinking mm. yeah because it's a book yeah because it kind of uh, strikes a chord with this it's basically um it compares the airline industry with the healthcare industry interesting um, using the black box so the black box was implemented in airplanes so that they could learn exactly the reasons why any air disaster happened and they've got considerably safer haven't they and they've got like yeah um, and and so, the, but the same hasn't been applied so much mm. in healthcare, and so you get, you can have the same tragedy, avoidable tragedy, um, happening in several hospitals because they're not. There's no channel for them to learn from mm. those mistakes. Well, I well, think that's that's, that's yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing is that the NHS is one of the most, probably after the military in the UK, possibly the most hierarchical structure. And you exist, you know, as a rank doctor in a system. And mm. if you dare speak up in a particular, really? you know, that is the uh, old school mentality there is a shift following that book um, which actually documents a, a story of a, a a guy whose whose wife sadly passed away in an avoidable incident in uh, under anaesthetic it was, yeah. where, really where anaesthetist went into this locked in vision and didn't think about other solutions they were all very senior no one that was watching felt comfortable speaking up uh, and there's a big movement um in the NHS with, with think, following that case, but also towards patients with things like the My Name Is campaign to always facilitate collaboration and good communication and to crush hierarchy by bringing people together in a, in a democratic way. Mm. Um, on, on, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please. Oh, on that note, is it, do you, have you found resistance from curmudgeonly old doctors who, who don't want to prattle around <laughs> in an app? <laughs> Yes, um, yeah. we face resistance from 
all sorts of personas within right. the system and, and all sorts of people. Yeah, not to pick on. I but I don't think you can justify the res I, I'd be amazed mm. to see what the case for the resistance is. Mm. You'd, you'd be surprised when trying to give people value at work, what the resistance can be like, because we, we originally thought that a lot of our user group were averse to technology because they didn't know how to use it. And generally speaking, that, that isn't the lesson. Generally, it's they don't want to use it, they don't know how to, because you know if someone's using uh, Facebook Messenger with 100 of their friends and they're ordering their, everything they buy on the Amazon app, et cetera, et cetera, that they know how to use a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Then you go and try and implement forward among a group of community nurses, for example, and you occasionally face questions like, uh, I recently heard somebody say, will, will we be reimbursed for the charging costs at the wall of our phone that we're using for this purpose? And you see the matter of commodity costs of several pence. That no, no one is facing that level of uh, inquiry or poverty even in, in, in the NHS, to my knowledge. It's purely a resistance and it's saying whatever you do... Quite creative we're, we're in the excuses yeah. they can come up with. I mean, marks for, the, for one of the four C's there. I've never yeah. thought to charge somebody for the electricity uh, generation. Mm. Um, because it's quite exciting this I could I'm literally thinking you could link it up to somebody communicating back in real time stock mm. present in a certain part of the hospital whether you're running out of bandages mm. needles this that the other in real time and, and you're getting loads of nodes mm. essentially around an NHS hospital mm. feeding back into a mm. central system where you, you, you the use cases are into the hundreds and thousands and um, yeah I mean because it's, it's kind of timely because it, as it, you probably saw on the news this morning that they were talking about the financial woes of the NHS mm. and how there's a plan I think for 20 billion by mm. 2023 mm -hmm. um, but presumably the ultimate solution is rather than to pump more money into a system mm. that is just struggling because it's an old an older system and it just has there's so much strain on it um, but to create effic better efficiencies within the system mm. and it, do you have a, a, a long term I realise that the problem that you're attacking now is a big one, but mm. a long-term um, strategy for moving into other areas within the healthcare system. Mm. So, as I touched on, for us it's not all about efficiency, it's about improving patient outcomes. And even that language on efficiency and patient outcomes is very much the language that the government is currently using, and to a degree we need to understand that, but we, we also want to help redefine that. Because it's not about patient outcomes, it's about actually improving the specific lives of individual patients who are people's mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. And keeping that kind of picture in, in your head as a founder or somebody trying to do something like this is really important because it gives you the, the drive to get through the challenges. So that's, that, that's just really a point on, on the language. But yes, it's about ultimately patience for us, not about efficiency of, of workforce. But, it, but, so, but isn't it like by creating the efficiencies, you're, you're making the space for doctors to be able to work better, which mm. produces the outcomes. Mm. Isn't, mm. isn't that, that, that? That's exactly yeah. it, yeah. Because I, I, don't, I don't want to thrust AI in the futurist type approaches or IoT in hospitals that, that mm. can communicate with these messenger apps. But, you know, does that sit within the vision? Mm. Could you have a series of machines around the hospital that start communicating into Dr. You know, X? Mm. to let him know how his patient is doing mm. so if you have a system of a, a grenade series of grenades of you know going off at one uh, all at once um, that you can then get updates on how critical each situation is based on the technology feeding back to you the app user so it's devices that can talk absolutely so we love having we, we've hired a couple of guys who are fantastic on, on, on head of product and as a CTO and we're, we're loving discussions that we have about what our roadmap could look like um, beyond what it does look like for the next three or so months. These things are absolutely possibilities, and they're not possibilities, they're inevitabilities if we claim a big network. Mm. The real advantage that we have in the approach that we're taking to lean user experience design and understanding the intricacies of healthcare systems are unlike Microsoft, Apple, Google, we have potential for scale of a network. That is inherently valuable. The stuff that comes around the data, the structuring and processing and transfer of it later is going to be a great second problem to solve. But for us, we have to solve the network challenges. And is, is it always going to be a bit of a struggle with NHS? Because I, I spoke to somebody once upon a yonder and they said to fire somebody is, is almost like a two-year process, if provable at all, mm. which means if, if it is 
difficult to say somebody simply is just not adding enough value mm. to this this system mm. yet your technology is trying to push against mm. some of these inherent hurdles mm. do, do you see a vision for how that might be overcome where you've just got underperformers who simply aren't invested in making the system um, run more efficiently mm. they get identified mm. by your platform just sort of mm. saying look they really aren't mm. doing what they're meant to be mm. doing what can the NHS do about do about that that's a really nice idea I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about that's definitely within the the kind of box of that would be amazing I think on the flip side of that the people that at this stage we have to really focus on are the champions of our product in the system so if you think about one say 1.3 million eligible users in the UK we would want to find out you know who are the 10,000 real champions that love what we're doing want to get behind it want to share it want to teach us what we're doing wrong those are the people that we, we have to get alongside us as we build out a community um, and f I think focusing on on those guys is critical because actually both are represented in the classical team if you imagine 10 people coming in a forward team you're going to have some Luddites who say what the hell is this I'm not using my phone you know whatever whatever I don't use smartphone for anything reimburse the cost of charging at the wall and then you're going to have someone saying this is amazing I want to work with you guys, I want to make this a success in this hospital, how can I help? And the two approaches are completely different mm. and we will only survive because our own resources are limited by focusing on that positive champion. Mm. It's a very nice way of looking at it. You mentioned before that you specifically picked the UK. Mm. Um, was there a reason for that beyond simply the fact that you, you're based here, you live here? Yeah, there is reason. So we. At a macro level, we understand the NHS, uh, NHS system very well. We're very well um, networked in it. We have strong relationships with the, the leadership of the NHS, but also with a lot of doctors and nurses in the system. And navigating the system is not easy, so being able to do that is, is a strategic advantage. It's the most, probably still the most respected health system in the world. So when you think about generating brand value internationally, um, there are some companies that are a step or two further along than us in the health space that generate an evidence base, even through R&D partnerships in the UK, and then take that learning overseas and start to roll out at serious scale. And that's a, a model that, that is, a, is a strong option um, for following. But the main reason is we want to be a product-driven company. We know that users in the UK are actually harder to win over on, in many respects than users in Europe. And so if you can bring thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of doctors, nurses and other staff onto our platform here, we're confident that we will understand the dynamics to do it anywhere. So we make the work harder up front, but we'll cash in later with a J-curve group. That's, that's so interesting. We had um, uh, a company called Humanizing Autonomy on. I was just thinking that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so they do um, software for uh, human-machine interaction, basically for self-driving uh, vehicles. Um, and they chose London as the... The, the proving ground for their software because the traffic here and the, the number of pedestrians it would have made it more complicated than anywhere else in the world it's just an interesting way mm. of thinking about picking the hardest mm -hmm. way to prove your what well, makes the incredible your, resilience of your your business model and the, the efficiency of the solution um because another point i think with the healthcare system is there's there's no cost to the consumer of just walking in and wasting some of the nhs's time I could have anything wrong with me and mm. I just might be feeling sorry for myself and there's nothing that stops me walking in. Whereas in America, you're acutely aware that walking in could cost you a couple of hundred dollars. I, mm. I don't know the system well enough, I'm making a generalization, mm. but you know, there, there is, you could see in America a reason where you could have digital triaging where it's like actually um, an AI thing will consult you first. Whereas here, it's like, absolutely not. I'm gonna get off the bus and I'm gonna go straight into Chelsea and Westminster and make sure I'm seen by a person, mm. irrespective of what my issues are. Um, so I imagine, solving our issues. Um, I, and I always say this when we're pitching health tech startups, like we have the NHS, we have a specific advantage because it's so so much pressure, there's so much data to be generated uh, that when you go into slightly more, um, uh, I don't know, less less stressful or, or more sort of mm. well-capitalized systems like mm. America, you, you've got an easier deal. Mm. Do you have any um, direct competitors? So the way we view our competition is WhatsApp is an entrenched competitor without even knowing it because it's claimed a big part of the user base. On the paging side, there's a, a monopolized system run by Capita in this system um, who again have strong incentives not to innovate because they've locked in kind of five or 10 year 
contracts with a lot of NHS organisations, and it's just a cash for the hardware sales for for the for the paging system for it's replacement of the the bleeps, and it's a cash cow for them. They must not believe their luck that they've dined out on that for so long. Mm -hmm. They must yeah. have thought with the pager is phased out in every other industry, but we're yeah. still going. Fortunately, we have a, a, a health uh, secretary in Matt Hancock who's made axing the facts and getting rid of the pager a big priority as you know it sounds like a nice soundbite but I think is, is actually serious about it um, so another competitor is Microsoft Teams because they've built this is a classic learning for us Microsoft are very well scaled throughout the NHS through their 365 offering and they can bundle in free products around that and they've got a very big and uh, well kind of well trained uh, Salesforce who can go in and say oh we've got this thing called Microsoft Teams why don't you roll that out as a communication product that you know you need but it's the wrong product because if you go and look at who actually uses it uh, clinicians don't like it mm. um, we, we spoke with the guys running this NHS email uh, contract with Skype for Business and that's an example of a, a massive failure of technology implementation where 1.2 million clinicians in the UK have access to a Skype for Business messaging service and 15,000 or so have ever logged in. Um, and you know, if you if you were a tech company rolling out a, a technology with those statistics, mm. that would be the end of your company. Yeah. Um, but in the NHS, it sort of just floats through and floats along. So those are some of the big kind of corporate competitors. And then there are some other application uh, companies also at an, at an early stage who are having a go at this. Two of us are funded, which are ourselves and, and, a, and a Dutch company who uh, we would predict have, 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 have the, the best likelihood of, of gaining a large network. Mm. Can we can we talk about the funding trajectory because um, you did get some exciting backers by Stride VC mm. which is obviously a new uh, VC on the block. Um, mm. How did those relate how did that relationship come about um, and, and what was pitching for VC like for you because you, mm. you raised a considerable amount how much was it in total? Well in the seed we raised about four million dollars it was slightly over in the end and in total we've raised about five and a half. Okay. Um, you raised that on an idea, without having built the the product. So the so no the initial you got the grant yeah and the loan yeah sorry. Yeah. Um, so relationships with so we went on a, a funding journey um, last year, which which ended up taking probably somewhere between three and three and six months, and we wanted to do it really well, and we wanted to bring in people that could really help the business, and we think we've put. The, the, the company uh, from a funding perspective in the strongest position it could be in because we've got the best consumer backers in the world mm -hmm. but we've also got some of the best healthcare backers in the world and their views on things are quite clashing so we've brought on what stride with Fred and Harry and we brought in uh, Albion with with a, a brilliant uh, former doctor called Christoph leading the, the deal on their side and a number of healthcare angels who are really uh, strong including a couple of founders of of, of successful health tech companies. So the advice that we get across the, the spectrum, the networks are really strong. Uh, and, and Fred was instrumental in building a company called PillPack, which is exited to Amazon very recently, which which I saw around its genesis whilst, um, whilst at MIT and, and learning from Elliot, who had just founded PillPack and was teaching our class about some of his his uh, learnings in, in, in that journey. So the fact that those guys have built successful consumer products like Deliveroo and, and Zoopla as well as healthcare companies and then having the senior health expertise as well is kind of a, a perfect roster of investors and now we've just got to kind of do the hard work and, and, and get to the next stage. Um, so the, what, what is the next stage? The next stage will be a series A. Um, and what do you have to do to get there do you think? So we have some uh, very focused company goals that we're all driving towards, which, which, which I won't say on here. Sure, sure. But we feel that if we if we get there, we're very confident that we can uh, do a round that sets us for scale. The seed was the learning round, mm -hmm. and the, and the Series A will be the the, the scale round. Well, Ollie does marketing, um, and so this mix of cons something that it, you know any consumer can pick up as a doctor, um, there's enough of them to be called a consumer potentially, uh, versus places to find them and market your solution to them. How do you think at scale you will acquire users or are you just mm. gonna rely on network effects within mm. the institutions? Mm. So a fascinating question that we don't have a perfect answer to. The definite truth about healthcare in general is that the unit economics of acquisition are poor. That's why a lot of, 
established tech companies don't hunt down healthcare. But the flip side of that is once you win these guys, mm. you can, in, you can Im embed users for a long period of time. And so the lifetime value of a user might be very high. Because um, we see Babylon Health, are, are, they are able yeah. to advertise on the tube because they're that consumer facing mm. that they can kind of push their mm. marketing out there. But I'm sort of trying to work out how you reach mm. potential customers. Because you said 1.3 million potential users mm. in, in the UK. Mm. Mm. That, but it, that's at the, the healthcare professional level, and that's including so that's that's clinical uh, users, including all social care staff. Yeah, um, there are actually users beyond that. You know, the NHS is the largest employer in the UK, and actually, the number of administrative staff you could look to put on an application like this is very high. And mm. do you do you go and add locums to that? Do you add uh, yeah. pharmacies so you can send your prescription over quickly, um, uh, and therefore it spiders outside of just healthcare professionals as well? Or physios, for instance. Yeah. So, so in terms of outside of healthcare professionals, there are decisions to be made. My view would be if we've figured out the dynamics to really scale something organically among healthcare professionals here, we should do it elsewhere, um, and, and that's probably where we'll we'll be headed in terms of going wide before we go deep. Mm. And and what's your feeling on how you interact with? Um, some of the other emergent notable healthcare tech companies mm. in the UK, like you know, do you have a view on on any of those like Babylon, who you'll look to work with, mm. are naturally competitors mm. to you? So we have really good relationships with some of these uh, companies doing doing well, like like Babylon Health and uh, Touch Surgery and Medopad. Um, and I think often it's tempting to have technical integration discussions when we talk about us wanting to be a platform company. And we have to be very disciplined in those discussions because actually our roadmap is tight and focused. And we need to just deliver on that and deliver value to lots of people through our product before we look to kind of diversify mm -hmm. what we're offering. So the relationships are generally soft and, and just learnings and, and uh, shared, uh, sh yeah, sh shared learnings and, and, and encouragement really. I was going to say we could do do a little future gazing now. Yeah, yeah. let's talk a bit more generally. For I think we've we've covered a lot of forward. Mm. If if, if, mm. if there's anything else you want to say, we'd have no, to, happy talk to move on. Yeah. Um, but yes, there is a looming and slightly unpleasant discussion. I don't think any of us need to offer our views on it. But um, it seems that Brexit may be causing some strain or stress on the NHS. Mm. Do you have a take on on that mm. and what the outcomes may do to affect the NHS? Mm. Depending on what the outcomes. De are. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whatever they may uncertainty, be. Uncertainty amid yeah. uncertainty. So I, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on the NHS in Brexit, but two of the thoughts that I would have are, there's a lot of commentary around staff. Obviously the NHS has a major staffing problem and major groups of uh, frontline workforce like nursing staff in hospitals um, have a majority European uh, dynamic. So actually there, there may be a, a question around are there staff that need to, to leave the UK at any point? And, from a pure NHS perspective, that would seem like absolute madness when we've got gaping holes in, yeah. in workforce already to allow that to be an issue. So that's that's uh, an area that's, that's highly popularised. One of the areas that I would be interested in, that I've, I've done some research on previously, is around uh, macroeconomic factors and corresponding health outcomes. So there's a load of evidence, um, for example, from uh, economic crises in Latin America that have really long-term impact on population health outcomes. So for example, when there is a crash, what are the 10-year mortality outcomes like? Ah. Generally speaking, there are correlations. It depends what, you know, what macroeconomic variable you look at, um, whether it's employment or inflation. Um, but I would be aware of that evidence, and if I was a, kind of a, 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 someone in, in the health ministry, I'd be thinking about are we sure we've relayed the points to the, the government at large that an economic crisis here will have major health repercussions? I mean, it's a slightly tacky reference from me, and I apologise for it in advance, but I think the first time I was made aware of that link between macroeconomics and health um, and mortality rates was the big short. Okay. And watching it when you talked about you know them celebrating the upside they were going to get from shorting mm. um, all the mortgages, futures mm. and whatever. And he, he said, stop celebrating because that's probably 40,000 people who have lost their lives mm. per you know X number of mm. GDP that's wiped out. Mm. Um, and it is worth probably matching those conversations up better because of, of course, it, you know, I, I don't know exactly how that would relate to health issues, but I don't know whether it's people can't feed themselves proper food or, mm. or just simply, um, but it is worrying. Mm. 
and, and I think the, the, the evidence suggests it's a combination of factors, as is so often the case in healthcare. There are physical elements to people's um, emerging health conditions, and there are mental health elements. Yes. So if you, you know, just to take an example of anyone who is uh, less cash in pocket in the midst of a, an economic crisis, there might be unemployment and all of the fact, feelings and factors of loss around that that lead someone to become depressed which has, you know, is clearly a, a, a part of their, their mental health condition. At the same time, they may not be eating well, their diet may deteriorate, as you, as you suggest, they may start smoking because of stress or drinking more. And there are various, obvious, various health, uh, physical health um, factors in that. Um, so it, yeah, it'd be interesting to, to look at those as well. And, you know, I'm not an expert on that stuff, but it's, it's this interesting point of advocacy around you know, does 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 the government around Brexit even understand that that might be a long term consequence? Mm. And as we touched on earlier, often it seems often in the policy sphere that decision making isn't governed by ten year or twenty year impact down the line. No, a different question, perhaps. Do you have any uh, feelings about what the the biggest health threats might be mm. in the in the coming years? Mm. I think one of the highly spoken about and, and very interesting places that healthcare is headed is this shift from, we talk about it a lot at Forward, but this shift from health services being done in sick centres like hospitals and shifting towards wellness programmes which are in terms of their location in a different place like ideally at home but certainly in the community mm. and in terms of being reactive at present moving towards a place where the system is proactive and preventative mm -hmm. and that's obviously where a lot of public health interventions kick in the one that i'm really interested in is in psychology and, and mental health care people learn about this framework called the biopsychosocial framework which is where whenever someone gets a, a, a health condition you can say what are the biological factors here what are the psychological factors and what are the social factors that can build up this this uh, build up to this condition and I think we're heading to a place where through all sorts of technology and, and, and data analysis and um, algorithmic programming we can say well actually for example we know the genomic profiles of people so we can we can start to predict what the biological risk profiles are for people in terms of psychological risk as our understanding of neuroscience gets better we'll move from very kind of embryonic models of, of how um, disease pathways fit together particularly for mental health conditions mm. to very molecular personalized understanding and then on the social factors we'll understand you know what are and what are the weightings of various risk factors for causing disease and when you put all of that into modeling you can start to say wow we could at the population level intervene for people's healthcare in a way that is really powerful mm. I was gonna say do you, do you think that the uh that the the power in that is going to come from private companies like there's a lot of like we had thriver mm, on there's mm. 23 and me dna mm, fit mm. um do you think there's value there or is that pe people getting the information personally and then not really knowing what it means mm. i think in terms of how that will happen a lot of this is like a classic american spin out style which the landscape for which doesn't exist perfectly in the uk but it, it often looks like brilliant researchers with brilliant commercial people if they're not in the same person then in a group um, because this requires really deep research work that takes a lot of time and, and like world leading expertise combined with people who know how to navigate commercial systems right. um, and I, I think that's where this is likely to emerge from that doesn't mean it can't exist in a in a single payer health system like the NHS. It's just that it, it probably in it, in its current model won't be designed inside it. This is interesting, and Ollie and I have both been Thriver users. Uh, I'm happy to throw mm. mud at the wall with new technologies to to aid self discovery, mm. um, and it would be nice to think I could then export some of that information to doctors to assist them in treating me. But it's hard to know whether mm. it feels like I'm trading gimmicky information with them that they. I I felt like that. Mm. I, I once tried to say that I had this piece of information from something like Thriver. Mm. No, actually, maybe from Atlas Biomed, um, who we also had on. Mm. Um, and the doctor was sort of, he was, I guess because they want to do their own tests mm. to, you know, they don't want to take, they can't, well, they can't take in someone else's mm. um, information. Mm. I don't know. 
But it's just, you, you, you know, it, it, they, you can see how it would improve the, the relay of information and the statistical mm. outcome or likelihood that you are going to suffer from something. I think the, the, the point you're touching on, which I, I really am interested by because we're seeing a lot of startups trying to address it in a B2B model in the workplace, is this avoiding mental degradation. Uh, and am I correct in saying that you know periods of, of elongated stress can upregulate and downregulate genes, which can mm, definitely really cause harm to people? By the time you get to that, it's like chronic illness. Mm. Do you think the solutions coming out are proficient? Are they are they good enough? Mm. Is it is it good enough for for small startup companies to come into the workplace and try and solve people's mental health, or what what do they need? I think it's incredibly difficult if you're a small startup company in the mental health space to try and run an end-to-end process from brilliant product design and the research elements that, that might go into that to navigating all of the governance, procurement, etc. Of, of, a, of a health system. So you've got to choose which parts of the uh, kind of problem you want to tear apart and solve. Um, and I think a lot of people fail because they try and do everything. Um, I don't know that anyone's cracked that particular problem, and that is one that needs to be cracked, but it's compelling as a future uh, case to the NHS, for example, of, you know, we know what's happening inside the uh, genetic material of your workforce. Um, what, what should we do about that together? And, and, and co-writing the story with the NHS, I think that would be really powerful. Um, again, that, that is certainly something that's uh, on the agenda, and it's something that you know the, the the digital leaders of the NHS definitely want to claim is this area of of genomics. You know the DNA structure was was defined in the UK. Uh, sequencing happened early in the UK, mm. um, and how do we keep ahead of that curve? And how can the NHS play a part in it? Those are mm. good questions to to try and answer. But the danger with that is the advantage to be sought from being forward thinking with CRISPR and stuff like that is to play f- fast and loose. Mm. And unfortunately, I don't think our system lends itself to that. So, mm. you know, some people sort of say, well, the Chinese just push the technology a bit harder, a bit faster, mm. learn more mm. at the expense of maybe some ethical decision making. Mm. And are we hamstrung by the fact mm. that we're, we're going to try and go through the right processes? Mm. Mm. Um, because yeah, unfortunately, you, you do learn. Drug discovery is, is mm. you learn by mistakes, unfortunately. It's, it's, it's a very difficult area. Um, what's definitely true is that in healthcare innovation, bulldozing is not possible so innovation must take place disruption is a difficult word to use mm. um, you know I've, I've said earlier in this we, we are trying to hold trust as our absolute core value at forward and that means that when we have a decision about data processing we need to make the right decision even if it costs time because the, the hope even from a strategic perspective is that by doing that consistently you do build a brand that is trusted and that that has that kind of running through its its bloodstream, um, and, and and that's what we're hoping to do. And it, it's tempting to to cave on those issues in the in you know in in, in exchange for progress. And uh, you know we're determined to hold to hold those those things core. Cool. I'm going slightly mindful of your time. Um, so if you're happy, yes, should we move to the just quick fire questions? Yeah. Um, so can we have a prediction for the future from you? I think that. Well, let's come back to this one. Okay, come back to yeah. it, yeah. Um, a, a book, startup book or resource or tool mm. that you, you'd recommend as an entrepreneur? Okay, interesting one. Um, I, I finished one this morning actually called The Mum Test, which I think a lot of people will have read, but it's about how, you know, how do we actually ask good questions mm. of, of, uh, of users of a, of a product. That's a fantastic book. The book I read over Christmas was stolen from my other half, Lara, which was Becoming by Michelle Obama, which everybody seems to be reading. Hmm. I've heard, yeah. It was great because, if nothing else, you learn a lot about um, Obamacare, and you do learn lots of things, actually, but Obamacare and and the way that Michelle supported um, Barack in in really being passionate about implementing this policy for 20 million previously uninsured Americans, and the way that both of them persevered in making that happen was inspiring Mm -hmm. because I don't really currently understand the state of it all you hear is that sort of Trump's trying to tear something tear it down and and the next person into Mm. into office just seems to slag off the work of the person previously so it's Mm. it's unclear to me Mm. how successful Obamacare was some people deem it as as not having been successful Mm. some people say that it was you know, an epic mm. go at trying mm. to do this. Mm. Do, do you have a take on that? Just I have a take on it. And if you're one of the 50 million previously uninsured Americans, it can only be a good thing. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, and there are, you know, when you think about what that really means, that 20 million people who are, it's, it's not clearly not perfect, but generally speaking, are able to go to bed at night feeling that their healthcare could be looked after, you know, not, not by the absolute premium provider potentially, um, but that, that's serious change. Yeah, um, I, yeah I think, it, you know, it gets highly politicised and it is a very complicated uh, arena, but I think that was an amazing, amazing piece of legislation. Um, what's the best advice you've ever you've received in this context? Mm. I had a conversation recently with with someone I mentioned called Tony Young, who's the kind of head of innovation in in, in healthcare in the UK, and he helped my thinking around basically thinking about how our brains work and how people talk about head versus heart when they're making a lot of decisions, and how even our awareness about how our brains are working on certain things like. The fact that we have a limbic system in our, our midbrain structures are wired to be emotional processes and how our neocortex and our things like our orbitofrontal cortex are, are wired for executive decision making. If you think about those things, that's your thinking like your with your heart and with your head in a, in a conventional sense. And for me, being aware of that is making a big difference in terms of trying to understand the way that I think hmm. and the way that, that, that in general we make decisions. Um, and and do we want to come back to if you don't have a prediction sure. we we won't um, we'll just well, cut one it out. of the things we touched on that I think is really interesting is those four C's that are likely to be um, useful factors for people to do interesting things in the twenty first century so communication collaboration creativity and critical thinking feel like really soft things but in the tech space they're really interesting because people talk about how. AI is going to, to, to clean out jobs, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a concept. And actually, in the, in the context of tech becoming more and more powerful and machines becoming more and more powerful, it's the things that humans can do that machines can't do mm. currently or, or potentially for a long time in the future that are really valuable in that setting. And so those skills are critical ones to have. And you start to see that even when you think in, in healthcare, what are the disciplines that are undisplaceable? And a lot of the softer consulting ology disciplines like rheumatology or hematology that are quite cerebral, mm. that require long-term collaboration with patients, clear communication, critical thinking around their, um, their diagnosis and, and potentially even creativity around how you structure their, their treatment. Those are the disciplines which I think are, are, are really exciting um, for the future. And, you know, to that vein, it looks a lot more threatening when you're doing a, a largely manual process like surgery, for example, which which one might imagine it could be replaced by a, by a robot. Mm. Um, that 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 comment probably won't go down <laughs> well in half of medical uh, <laughs> world. But um, yeah, that that's an interesting interesting thought. And do, do you think there is work? I know I'm going over this quick fire limit, but I'm going to do it. You're um, incorrigible. In in terms of just positivity when it comes to rehabilitation of, of patients? I think at, at the theoretical level there, there's a thing called logotherapy that Viktor Frankl thought about um, from concentration camps in the Second World War mm. that was about, essentially it was in a book called Man's Search for Meaning and it's saying it's that book. whenever someone has meaning uh, they can, you know, he who has a, a why can tolerate almost any, um, any, any uh, how I believe is the phrase but the, the concept is you can get through through anything if you've got meaning and at the biochemical level probably what's happening is you know you, you're right your stress hormones um, fluctuate but you've got all sorts of hormones moving around your bloodstream and you've got endorphins and the the, the power of positive thinking is reflected in those things and mm. yes that will have a, a, a knock-on effect on how your genes are expressed and how your brain is functioning well, that's interesting and last but not least um, we like to try and support uh, each entrepreneur who comes on the show to see if we can try and help uh, with our audience to to kind of empower them to help you. Um, mm. So if there was anything you could ask our audience um, that would be beneficial to forward, what would it be? Would it be doctors using the app or, mm. or is mm. there, there any other advantages? The, the really big focus for myself and the co-founders at the moment is hiring uh, a, a team that we are convinced can change the world that's 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 where we're at and we're trying to hire absolutely amazing people and we've got 12 roles out for for grabs at the moment um, and so if you are able to float something in, in the network you know there's a, a website which is forwardhealth.co slash jobs so forward slash jobs um, 
there are four roles in engineering, uh, two in product. Uh, there's a, a role in informatics. There's a role in success and community. Um, so yeah, we'd love to have some brilliant people that are listening apply for those roles, and we'd love to to come meet you. I feel like they'd be ever so lucky to work there. It's a very inspiring company. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you very much for your time, Bonnie. Really appreciated having yeah, you on. Really enjoyed it. Thanks um, a lot, guys. Been enjoyed being here. Thanks. <laughs>